thank you so much for inviting me here. Oh, what I do for a living now is I train Python programmers every week, thousands of them for uh, not thousand a week, a thousand a year. And cumulatively, I have taught about uh, 4,000, 4,500 people. And the rest of the people on my team and my small training army were up to about a total of 8,000. And so that's what I do for a living. And if you teach for a living, you have a really hard time turning it off. So, very shortly, I'm going to give you a few details, teach you something, and then there will be a pop quiz. Sorry. Uh, I also need some uh, test victims, some people uh, uh, to volunteer, and I'm looking for Travis Oliphant. Travis is supposed to be sitting on uh, the front row by the uh, two Olas. I'm also looking for uh, Gavri. You should come sit with the uh, two Olas. And I met a couple people yesterday. Tal, are you here? And Nofar, are you here? OK, only uh, three test victims. Fair enough. How many of you know the title of my talk? How could you possibly know? I hadn't decided on it yet. It's not even on the slides or not uh, announced. What do you think it's about? It's about super. That is an incorrect hypothesis. Five bucks for guessing, though. Ah, shekels. <laughs> so it's about something cool that I do, not in my intro classes, but uh, in the advanced class. I have intro and an intermediate and advanced. In the advanced classes, people have been through two full weeks with me already. They've been out practicing Python. And when they come back to me, we do code reviews. We try to really go very deep in, uh, 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 to their skill set. And one of the things that we try and develop is the ability to do design reviews. And for me to take them through a full design review takes about three hours. I'm going to compress that into uh, uh, much less time. And you're going to see the outcome of uh, uh, one that we've done. Uh, there was a proposal to put a transformation dictionary into the core of uh, Python. And during the evaluation period, I used it as the design project and let everybody know this is a real decision that needs to be made. Include the transform dict in the standard library or don't include it. Uh, I try and raise the stakes a little bit at the beginning to say, when there's a pep behind a proposal and you say no to it, it's like taking a vampire and putting a stake through its heart. You kill it dead, not just for now, but for all eternity and all variants of the idea. So if it was a good idea and you killed it, you have to live with this forever. <laughs> On the other hand, if you say yes to it and it goes in and it turns out that it uh, is a distractor to people, that it makes them worse off in some way, that it precludes some other line of uh, uh, development, once you put something into the standard library, it's extremely difficult to take out and you have to live with it for all eternity. For all we know, your great-great-grandchildren will be programming something that you approved and said yes to, but was clearly a terrible idea. But now the entire world depends on it as a dependency, and you can't take it out. It could be your fault. So don't say yes too easily. Don't say no too, uh, too easily. Fair enough? All right. So is this talk about the transform dict? No. That just happens to be the case study. This talk is about uh, how to do uh, uh, design reviews and a few thoughts uh, on how to approach it. So we'll actually start with the uh, subject under test, which is the transform dicta uh, itself. Uh, I'll try and make the type smaller for you. Here you go. There. OK. Uh, any questions? OK. We'll go the other way around. Some people do slides. Uh, my new thing is to do uh, a sphinx. So I'd like to introduce the transform dict. Dictionaries are a wonderful general purpose tool, uh, foundation of the language. Quito has a thought about uh, dictionaries and list. He thinks those two are foundational, that if you had those two, you could build any other mutable data structure that you needed on top of them. And he actually wanted to keep it somewhat small and was a little reluctant to put sets in, but ultimately came convinced to uh, do that. And so a lot of people think of that as the third mutable container that they manipulate most often. But in fact, Quido still thinks of it as uh, uh, the two. De being a really good general purpose tool causes people to want to make variations of it. If it were terrible, people wouldn't try and make variants. Over the years, there's been hundreds of uh, uh, variants. 
you don't have to scan too far in any a large code base to find some subclass of dictionary that specializes it in one way or another. Over the years, several variants have made it into uh, the standard library. Uh, Python didn't start out with sets. Sets were, grew as an offshoot of uh, a dictionaries and are now fully uh, standalone, but they were a dict variant at the outset. Counters, chain dicts, uh, uh, default dict, uh, even uh, persistent dictionaries like shells are in the uh, uh, standard library. Do we have a lot of variations of dictionaries? So how many? Here's all the uh, variations that are out there. Here's the number in the standard library. Should we put them all in? No. So it needs to be a uh, select few. So a core developer who was working on a case-folding, case-preserving dictionary had a bright idea. How about, instead of limiting it to that one use case, they factor out the transformation step, the case folding, make that parameterized. Do you think you should take uh, decisions and hardwire them into your uh, code, or do you think you should leave them as parameters so that people can extend your code without rewriting it? It's not a trick question. <laughs> oh, yes, generalization. Generalization is a, a good thing. So that was the inspiration. Why make things something too specific? The only change that was made to the design was to take out the case folding step and say, maybe we want to do something other than fold a case. Does that seem like a generally good idea? And it came from a core developer, and it was discussed on the Python mailing list, and it had lots of friends, and a lot of people liked it. Now are you liking it better? OK. Let's see uh, how it does. First, I should tell you what it is. Our, I'm going to let it tell you what it is. Here's its uh, doc string. Study it for a moment. There will be a pop quiz in a couple minutes, and I'm not kidding. So it's a dictionary. It calls the transformation function whenever it looks up a key. When does it uh, call the transformation function? When you're looking at a value or a key? Key. When you store a value or when you look it up? It says looking up, but possibly it might do it when it stores. We'll see. It makes some claims. Some objects claim to do something and actually do something else, and sometimes you have to read between the lines. And here's the idea. The transformation in this case is lower casing a string. So the idea is we take a, uh, a key, foo with a capital F, and store the value of 5. Before the uh, storage takes place, what transformation do you think is going to happen? It's going to lowercase foo. Do you think the transformation will also happen on lookup? What's your hypothesis? That is, in fact, a uh, correct hypothesis. And because of that hypothesis, as the doc stream claims, all of these are equal to each other. Interestingly, we've uh, done uh, three lookups in a dictionary and shown their equivalent to each other. How many keys do you think there, in a, there are in the dictionary? One. one. And the evidence of that down here is we take a set of all the keys, and there's only one. So you basically got what it is. It makes transformations, which is why it's called which shows the value of naming things very plainly, which is uh, fantastic. Let's look, look at, uh, at its uh, API. I loop over uh, everything in the directory and get uh, uh, filter out the underscore methods. Do these methods look familiar to you? Have you seen anything that looks like them before? If not, you're fired. <laughs> these should all look very familiar to you. Which, uh, which things here don't look familiar? Transform file. Is that the only thing that doesn't look familiar? Clear is an incorrect hypothesis. You don't get fired for that one, but borderline. <laughs> Five bucks. Five shekels. All right. OK. Something else is different. What is it? Yeah. Why is it most people didn't see that? Because lots of dictionaries have a dunder get item. This is a non-dunder get item. I believe this was a defect in the design because most folks who are experienced Python programmers scan wide right over it and don't realize it's there, which raises the question, what does it do? So we've shown one of its capabilities, the transformation function. It has another uh, capability as well. Remember, it was based on a case-preserving dictionary, and the idea is it has the ability to look up the currently stored value. So improve my zooming skills here. So the get item method you just saw, what it does is looked up uh, foo, runs it through the transformation function, and recovers the original uh, key that we used to store it, the capital F. In addition, the get item doesn't return a single value, a key. It actually returns the value as well. What do you call a key value pair in Python? A key value pair. 
An item, exactly. All right, so, which is why this one is called get item. Now, get item everywhere else means get the value, but here it actually means get an item as in uh, dictionary items. You guys got the gist of the transformation dictionary? Would you like to know how it was made? We can look inside it, and there are three things pushed together into one. In fact, most of the time when we build new data structures, we're starting with other elements that already exist, composing them together, taking the atoms, and making a molecule. So transform dict is a molecule, and its three atoms are, it has a transformation function, of course. Uh, stir case fold was designed exactly for this. It's a variant of a, a string lower that is much more Unicode aware. It also has two dictionaries inside. How many of you are surprised that uh, one, something called a transform dict instead of transform dicks has uh, two dicks inside? These are internal implementation details. You're not supposed to know that. Of course you wouldn't know. But in fact, there are two dictionaries. Are there any implications for it in terms of space and speed? Keeping them up to date takes time and space. And here's what they store. They take the transform key, the lowercase uh, key, and map it to the value, as you might expect. But remember, we have to support this get item method that recovers the original key. We've got a dictionary for that, too. Is it pretty easy to get back to the original key? So one of the interesting things, I think, about the design is externally, the way you use it is you look up an untransformed key, this, uh, this one right here. Internally, those aren't stored at all. It's the transform key that is uh, uh, stored. Uh, so the external API is actually quite different from the internal uh, API. So here's what it looks like from the outside. Uh, here's, and I, I'll discuss it, since it claims to be a dictionary, our immediate question is in what ways is it different from a dictionary? One is the transformation function was stored as a read-only attribute. I was surprised by that at first, but it helps uh, uh, the structure keep its data integrity in case you change the transformation function after you put keys in, which of course would be crazy. How many dicks does it have it ins inside? Two. You can't possibly know that because they're not exposed. Externally, it looks like a single dictionary. So how is the combined dict modeled? It's modeled quite differently from the internal dictionary. It turns an untransformed uh, uh, key into a value. My timer is not going to work very well if I don't turn it on. There we go. I could be up here all day. All right. And then uh, there's an items method, and the items what do they return? Key value pairs, which raises the question, which key? It's the untransformed key to the current value, which would kind of makes sense since you're putting untransformed keys into it and you can't see the transformed uh, uh, key. Does it make sense to you that the original untransformed key is here? Is it all untransformed keys or the original one? It's called original untransformed key. Is it the original one or all untransformed keys? Hey, I, you guys are a quick study. You see how I teach. Uh, all right. Sometimes I give out food in my class when people make correct predictions. No. You guys are being pretty well fed, so none of that for you. All right, the get item method is modeled. You take an untransformed key and you get back uh, this pair, the key value pair we saw earlier. And then another design decision that, uh, is that dictionaries support a dunder missing method, uh, which is Incredibly powerful, very useful, and shockingly few people know about it. Do you all know about the dunder missing method? Of course you do. I just told you it was there, and I said it was very powerful. You should go uh, study it at uh, uh, some point. It'll improve your life. But that's the subject for a, a different talk. But you don't get one with the transform dick. I know you don't miss it because you didn't know it was there a few minutes ago. I would miss it because I use it all the time, which is why they call it dunder missing. <laughs> Nufar asked for jokes. She watched one of my other videos and just said, make sure you have good jokes tomorrow. And, and you know how much pressure that puts on you the night before? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right. OK, uh, now for my panel. Is Travis here yet? No Travis. You ask him to volunteer, and then OK. All right. My panel was picked to be representative of the kind of folks who are my advanced Python class. Each of these people up on the front row is exceptional in some way. They are far above average Python programmers. They're extraordinarily good, which raises the question, can they understand and predict what this does? If they can't, does it mean uh, that there's any problem with their understanding? No. Remember, our presumption is they're awesome Python uh, programmers are awesome in some way. 
So if they don't make correct predictions, what is, has to be the cause of the problem? It's a design issue. And if your best programmers have a problem with it, it raises the question, what are, uh, how is it going to affect all of the other programmers? So I've set up some instrumentation. I've wrapped around Casefold a global counter so I can count how many times Casefold gets caught. You should ignore all this part. Oh, it just says, I'm setting an initial count to zero. Every time I call case file fold, I'm going to call it. And show does something awesome. It shows what the current count is. You can see why I'm the big cheat. Oh, wait. OK. And so very basic uh, Python uh, programming. So we need to make uh, some predictions here. And let's see if I can complicate my life by changing screens and bringing up idle. Oh. Uh, what version of uh, Python are you using? How many of you are using Python 2.7? How many of you are using Python 2.6? 3.2. Anything before 3.2? 3.3? 3.4? And Benjamin, where are you? <laughs> are you and I the only ones at 3.6? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, a 3.6 that was built last night off of the head. OK. <laughs> you can see how Benjamin and I roll. <laughs> this is really cutting edge, because I didn't review all the check-ins that went in last night. I just built off of it and then prepared to demonstrate live on stage off of I mean, what could possibly go wrong? Build bots for green? There's another form of testing. It's live demos. OK. You can see why it's a good thing I don't make air traffic control software. <laughs> all right, here we go. We is in we. All right. We've got a uh, transform dict, and it case folds. Case fold would do the equivalent of a string lower, but case fold was designed specifically uh, uh, for this. So I go to uh, store Raymond is red, as I so often am, and run it, and it prints uh, no output and makes uh, what show does is demonstrate that one call was made to uh, a case fold. Did that tell you anything about what was going on inside? How many calls to case folder, uh, to the transform function are made per store? Exactly one. All right. Knowing that, make a prediction. What will the cumulative count be up to after this? I have a whole panel. OK. Two is, in fact, a correct prediction. Okay. Keep in mind, most people wouldn't be able to predict this because they hadn't been shown, uh, told the model of how it was worked inside. But I think it would be, have been an important part of the documentation to tell you a little bit about how it works so that you could make some predictions of uh, what the performance would be. Now, uh, Rachel is not like me. Rachel is so different. I've got this lovely little apple on the uh, front, and uh, she's a, she uses uh, Windows. So she's not really blue. She's Azure as so many Windows people are. Make a prediction. What will be the cumulative count? <laughs> We've seen Rachel before. We haven't seen her spelled this way before. But it is an existing key. Does it change your answer? I was just checking to see if you're making correct predictions. I'm not, I'm not judging you here. I am judging whether when a person uses this tool, whether they have any idea of what their machine is thinking about. So now we go to look up Rachel spelled with a capital R-A-C that hasn't been seen before. Do you think that will be a successful lookup? Does anyone say no? OK, good. And how many uh, calls to the transformation function will there be? Is the transformation cached from earlier? Or does it have to call the transformation function on lookup and store? You've already counted ones on stores. Make a prediction. How many calls will I be up to, three or four? I got one key here. Do I have any threes? So what I would do during when I uh, design reviews is I'd have a class of growing people and uh, because their judgments really mattered, I wrote down the numbers for uh, each of those. You guys are predicting much better than my uh, actual engineers uh, who are using Python every day. So in fact, it printed out that uh, lovely Rachel is Azure, and we made a uh, fourth call. Now, we're about to print out the items. Will that make a change to the uh, number of transformations, uh, uh, calls to the transformation function? Make a prediction, yes or no? 
How many yeses? Hold your hand up. Okay, how many noes? Okay, the no's are actually correct here, that the uh, transform values are stored inside, which was predictable to, be the, to the people in the front row because they told them they was going to ask the question, and they paid attention when I told them the internal design which stores the uh, transform keys. Most users would not know that, which explains the hands in the rest of the room. Now the items, uh, who are the two keys that are going to be in the dictionary? Uh, yeah. Okay, uh, anybody else besides Raymond and Rachel in there? How many Rachels are in there? One. Well, that is a correct hypothesis. You remember from a good part of the documentation is where it showed you the set earlier. That was, in fact, a correct prediction. How many of you think Raymond will be all uppercase? Yeah. Okay, how many of you think Rachel will be all uppercase? How many of you think Rachel will be mixed case? How many of you think Rachel will be transformed to the lowercase person she is? In fact, you were uh, correct that it was uh, uppercase. That is an interesting correct prediction, and I believe that in this group, you made the correct prediction because I went out of my way to tell you the internal design and to emphasize the original key was stored. However, if I had chosen other people who've used dictionaries like this, they almost all would have made a different uh, uh, prediction for uh, Rachel. And the reason is mo I went out and studied the case of uh, uh, insensitive case-preserving dictionaries that were out in the wild. They're typically in REST API libraries. And the ones I found all stored the last key and rather than the uh, uh, first key. So in fact, this one was designed differently from uh, most things that were uh, in, in the wild. Uh, also, this group did not predict incorrectly uh, all lowercase. However, in my classes of uh, uh, users, more than half would predict all lowercase. What is your hypothesis of why they think it would be lowercase? What would cause it to be lower if it was? It's because we've uh, case folded it, and their thought would be, my whole point was to fold the uh, case, and now here it is without uh, uh, the case. All right. You guys are doing pretty good. Uh, get item uh, Rachel. This time, uh, with a capital H-E-L, is the hell raiser she is to, uh, at this point. Okay, I got one vote for error. How many more votes do I have for a key error? How many of you think it will be a successful lookup? How many of you think she's blue? How many of you think she's Azure? The Azures are correct. Oh. And the interesting thing here is that get item returns a tuple. Almost no one predicts that, which is interesting because they also don't predict it uh, uh, usually even after they've been shown get item two or three times and the implementation. So this seems to be a defect in the design, at least in terms of people can be taught it and then don't uh, remember that a tuple comes out. And then to uh, make use of this, you'll have to use a square bracket zero to pull out the appropriate element. Okay, let's go do another more interesting one. Keep in mind, this whole thing was designed around caseful. That was what it was intended for, its first use case. It's what it got generalized from. So the next one up is, I have a transform dict where the uh, transformation function is int. What int does was it will convert a string to an integer or convert uh, other numeric uh, types to uh, an integer. So it's a, a constructor. And those of you who are familiar with default dicts, it looks very much like the setup for a default dict with a factory function. Seem familiar? So I set the string 12 equal to the string 12 spelled out, the string 13 to 13 spell, uh, spelled out. And what I'm going to do is loop over these. If a key is missing from a dictionary, what exception does it raise? That is, in fact, a correct hypothesis. And so whenever you do a square bracket lookup, there's one of two outcomes. A successful lookup, or what exception? Here. And being the careful man I am, do you think I catch exceptions? You bet. That's why they pay me the big bucks. Oh, wait. Why they should pay me the big bucks. <laughs> I catch exceptions. I know which ones are coming, and I always know when to duck. I never get hit with an uncaught exception. All right. Make a prediction. When it looks up uh, the integer 12, will it return um, the spelled out 12? True or false? OK. 12.0, will that return 12? True or false? 
How many truths? I'm going to see true hands go up. Okay, how many false hands? Okay, how many were going to vote false and then saw all the true people and decided to go with the crowd? <laughs> In fact, uh, that is correct because uh, these hash to the same value and they uh, are equal to each other. How about this one? How many of you say true? How many of you say false? How many of you are wondering what the little B stands for? <laughs> Bytes. That's the whole point about the Python 3 is uh, strings aren't strings anymore. They're Unicode. And then what used to be strings are now bytes, except the byte array displays as strings. As, well, OK, you get it. B is something bitey, and uh, without a B, it's stringy. OK, so uh, it turns out that uh, that one will go through. Eight, what will happen? What exception? Here. That is, in fact, the case. And so it'll say that number is not in the dictionary. What about this one? How many of you think it will be a successful lookup? Hmm, lots of people who are wrong. 13J. What does the J stand for? Imaginary. J is how you abbreviate an imaginary in Hebrew? No, it's how you, it's, uh, how you evaluated, uh, or it's how you abbreviated in electrical engineering. Why do you think they use J? I was taken by current. What's the logical abbreviation for current? C. Nope. They, uh, they used I. Uh, don't get me going on the signs. The positive and the negative are backwards. That was Benjamin Franklin's fault, by the way. All right, and then uh, hello. What will this do? And in fact, we are getting value errors here for the 12.0, which I will take out now. And we get a, uh, uh, can't com convert a complex to an integer. Take that one out. Okay. So some of you have been surprised so far, which is interesting because I walked you through methodically how it was implemented. It told, showed you uh, several uh, examples. On the other hand, these use cases are rare and exotic, and were you using those data types, you would probably know more about their properties. I don't think that is particularly damning. It just says sometimes when you have an interesting data structure, interesting properties uh, emerge. This in and of itself is not great. You all did uh, fantastic at predicting. And although it wasn't a judgment of you, this is a judgment of the uh, transformation dictionary. I've got a question for you. I've got this dictionary E now. I would like to look up what value was originally stored for the 12 as a key. What method do I use? Get item. That is, in fact, a correct uh, uh, prediction. And the what is in the dictionary now? The string 12 or the number 12? How many of you say string? OK. OK, how many of you say both? OK. How many of you wonder, uh, have had kind of a Bill Clinton, what is is, you know, where is is, you know, what is in? It actually matters what in what is meant by in here. Is it inside the dictionary, or can you get to it in? So from the external point of view, is it in the dictionary? How can you see what's in the dictionary? Items. And one of the things you'll notice here is that the uh, number 12 is not in here. In fact, there is no API to get to the uh, number 12. Does this worry you? What do containers do? They contain things, which is why they're called containers. Except this contains something that you can't get to. Does that bug you? It should. So let's go talk design principles uh, for, for a while and use some of the language concepts that arise during um, uh, design reviews. One is orthogonality. Um, rather than say it, I'll just put it on the screen. The ortho. And I won't read to you. You can uh, uh, get the uh, uh, gist from here. You can read, read yourself. But it's uh, principally all about loose coupling, uh, orthogonal design. And so the classic examples are in a car, the controls are orthogonal. If you turn the wheel, the car turns. You step on the brake, it stops. You step on the accelerator, it goes. Those are orthogonal controls, and you can manipulate them all separately. I know all about this because I've driven in Los Angeles, where I've seen people speed past me with the brake lights on. That wasn't a joke, that's true. 
How many of you knew I was a pilot? And I've got a uh, ground instructor rating, which means I can teach you how to fly a helicopter even though I've never flown a helicopter. Who thinks that's kind of cool? As a ground instructor, you can, I can teach all the parts. They've tested me on hot air balloons and helicopters, and I learned all kinds of interesting uh, things about helicopters, and this one's a classic. There are several different controls, and most people have a shockingly difficult time just doing the simplest maneuver in a helicopter, you take it and put it in a hover, and you hand somebody the controls, and you say, keep it in a hover. They typically can't without uh, training. In fact, things get out of control very, very quickly. If uh, things get out of control on an airplane, and you hand over the controls to a passenger who's never flown before, they can figure out pretty quickly what most of the uh, controls do. That's down, that's up, that's left, that's right, and they get it. But a helicopter is uh, quite different. Here's what happens. You start to sink just a little bit. Because you're sinking, you know you need no more power. So you start to twist in a little bit more power, which is great. That stops the uh, sink. But you put extra rot uh, power into the uh, uh, blades, and so you get a counter-rotation effect where you start to spin around. Then you need to step on the uh, what a pilot would call a rudder pedal, but that controls the tail rotor uh, fan, spinning back in a, uh, a different direction. Along the way, you need to change the uh, pitch of the air rotors as well, and you need to do all four of these things at the same time. If you don't, the helicopter just starts to look a little bit uh, crazy. You've all seen pictures in the movies of the helicopters getting out of control. Would you like to know what they do to make that happen? They take their hands off of the controls. <laughs> That's what it does right away. This is quite different from airplanes, where if I take my hands off the control, the airplane doesn't know that I'm not flying it anymore, and it keeps on flying right through clouds, whether I can see or not, which is kind of useful. What about the transform deck? It has three things in it, case folding, transform key to a, a value, a transform key to the original key, and it's been combined into one thing. How many of you have a judgment that the controls, not the internals, but the controls of the uh, transform dict are orthogonal? How many of you say non-orthogonal? So most of you say that the uh, transform dict is a helicopter. I concur. All right, let's switch from aviation to law. This law is uh, actually common in a lot of countries, but uh, how many of you know I was a certified public accountant in my, uh, in my country? And I had to study uh, a business law, and part of that was Uniform Commercial Code. And it turns out there is, by default, anytime you sell something, to uh, some implied warranties. There's more than uh, these particular two, but I'd like to tell you uh, about two that are pertinent for design review. One is a more warranty of merchantability. You can read what it's all about, but the bold part tells you the important part. The goods must reasonably conform to an ordinary buyer's expectations. So. When you come to buy a transform dict, and you are buying it because you're investing time in it, you're putting it in your code, you're publishing it, and you're staking your reputation on it. And you're checking it into GitHub so that 20 generations from now, your great, 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 great grandchildren will see the code you checked in and go, ooh, that was bad. We are the first generation where our work will basically be around forever for other people to uh, uh, research. Possibly the video I'm making right now with tasteless jokes will be you know, something that they watch for entertainment you know, 2,000 years from now. OK, so transform dick, you're buying one. Should you expect to get something that transforms for you? In fact, that's the case. So we evaluate how well it conforms to the buyer's expectations. And here's one place where it falls down. What if the transformation function is expensive? Let's say you do a very expensive transformation function to compute a value, and it gets stored in the transform dict. Based on what you've learned so far, can you get that value back out? It's a container that contains something but doesn't let it run out. So it's got a black hole property. Do most people look for black holes in containers? What, you've never written to dev null? That's intentionally a black hole. And it's sold as a black hole, in which case it doesn't violate this uh, warrant of merchantability. But if you're buying a transform dick, did you really mean to buy a black hole? In fact, you didn't. And we'll see examples of all of this uh, uh, shortly, depending on how well I'm doing with time, which is probably not particularly well. OK. Warranty of uh, fitness for a particular purpose. The, buy, uh, the most important part is highlighted when a buyer relies on the seller to select the goods that are fit to a specific request. When, you, when a person comes in for one thing and you give them something else, that's when you're in violation of uh, uh, this warranty. 
So uh, they're, they're going uh, 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 mountain climbing, and you sell them sandals. They believe, because of your expertise, you're recommending the right thing. Then when their feet are destroyed halfway up the uh, mountain, they're cursing you, but you know, they can't come back and complain because they're stuck on the mountain. You get how this goes. All right, so this one's a hard one to apply in a sense of when we make a transform dict, we don't know what you're buying it for. So it's hard to say that we made a representation to you. On the other hand, we're claiming that because we put it in the standard library, it's good, and it's something you should reach for, and you're going to reach it for it when? Whenever you have some notion of transformation in your head, and the uh, notion of transformation is very broad. Lots of things can be classified as transformations, so we can reasonably expect lots of people will uh, are, are reach for this. So here's an example being oversold. You, uh, you need a lightweight uh, pickup truck for your family just so you can shuttle some goods back and forth between your, your, your storage and, uh, and your, your flat. And instead, they said, oh, here's what you need is a heavy uh, dump truck with this big diesel engine that doesn't fit in uh, uh, small roads. They've sold you something too, uh, too heavy duty. Did they violate the uh, warranty of uh, fitness for a particular purpose? OK. Would you want that warranty violated with your transform date? It turns out most use cases for uh, transform dick, and I say most in terms of I've pulled lots of people. I've given them homework assignments to come up with use cases based on surveying their own code and come back and we play out these use cases to see how well they work. And uh, it turns out most use cases, other than the original use case, the case in services of uh, uh, preserving dictionary, don't need the second dictionary to restore, restore back to the uh, original key. They just want the transformation. They don't want to undo the uh, transformation, particularly if the transformation is from a bad thing to a good thing. When do you ever need to get back to the original bad? And it turns out that's not very common. So you pay a performance penalty for that and a storage penalty, but you pay other penalties as well in terms of code complexity. Uh, one of the nasty things about the uh, uh, transform deck is if you make a mistake in your design anywhere along the way, have you ever gotten a key error with the dictionary? No, it's never happened to me, but I, I understand. I've, I've heard this happen to a lot of you. When you get the key error with the transform dict, or anything goes wrong anywhere along the states, the stack, stack trace is somewhat complicated looking, and it takes a lot of thought to work, uh, work your way through. In particular, if you're looking something up, and the exception raised is not a key error, it was a value error. What would be worse than a value error in the middle of a transformation function? No, even worse. What is the worst error you could get in a transformation function? Remember, a person's expecting they might get a key error. What's the worst thing you could give them? A key error. That's exactly it. And your problem is uh, there are use cases that have dictionaries in the uh, transformation function. They raise a key error exception, except you're now handling the wrong key error. The key is absent from the wrong di uh, uh, dictionary. It might be in the transform dict, but not in the uh, 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 function uh, down below. So one of your, uh, your warranty violations here for f uh, fitness for particular purposes is that for most use cases, you've been sold a dump truck when in fact you needed a, uh, a light truck. And that truck is harder to operate, it's expensive to operate, it's slow and memory intensive. All right, now I get to quote uh, Chris Alexander. I'd quote him except he's, he's very wordy. Chris uh, Alexander is who we have to thank for design patterns. He didn't write uh, the Gang of Four Design Patterns book, he inspired it. Chris uh, Alexander was an architect. And he wrote uh, a book uh, uh, on pattern languages, and then programmers adopted the notion. The idea is that there are certain patterns that recur in the field of uh, architecture. One uh, pattern number 80-something, I think, was the cafe pattern, which I've observed out on the street that I'm say, uh, saying on, where people go out and sit in cafes on the street and watch everybody else go by and have a really good time. That is a design pattern. That street was designed that way for that purpose, to create a social uh, a, a focal point. And so Chris was a visionary architect and designer, not an architect of houses, but an architect of cities and uh, uh, communities. So you could read all of that, or you could read the bold part, which I think is incredibly well put, or you can get my paraphrasing. The real beautiful text are Raymond's version. Raymond's version says, a correct analysis of a problem depends on reconciling the requirements 
with realities emerging from the system itself. And what Chris realized that he had a toll booth example where he had been assigned to design a toll booth, and he was given some specific requirements for it. Here's how long it has to last, its weather requirements, uh, uh, size, cost, et cetera. And what he found, though, was when he got into the problem, there were functionalities that if what it had to do that conflicted with the requirements. And as you played out the system, the system taught you a little bit about how it uh, operated and changed the requirements. Uh, essentially, he was uh, discovering agile processes early on for architecture. So how does that apply to the transform deck? It was designed to requirements, not to use cases. In particular, what was the requirement? The requirement was someone was making a case-preserving, case-insensitive dictionary. Then they thought, I'm going to make a requirement if I'm going to factor out the transformation function, which is a perfectly reasonable thing to do, except for what wasn't done. It wasn't designed around user store stories and actual use cases. It only had one use case at the uh, uh, outset. How many of you think that it, when you uh, uh, take your library with your requirements that you made up in your head and you hand it out to the uh, whole world, that people might use it in a way different than you might expect? and that certain realities of the world might inflict itself on your system, which is perfectly fine. We do that in agile development, and we iterate on it. We try and ship uh, early, except in the case of standard library, where we say that's where code goes to die. In theory, it, code should be dead before it gets to the standard library, because making changes is fairly painful for people, because they rely on the standard library being standard. So our problem uh, was, this transform dict wasn't uh, released out to the real world with lots of people using it. In my mind, it was a 0.1 release instead of a 1.0 release. And lots of products changed quite a bit between uh, uh, these two. And the, well, the last concept here is generalization versus hypergeneralization. Which one of these two is good? Which one's bad? OK, I think you get how it is. So number one is the good one. Factoring is a good thing. It's where we extract redundancy. Too, we have uh, several uh, uh, functions that have redundant components. We factor it out. That separates the variable parts from the invariant, often leaving the invariant part very pure and encouraging reusability and also making the tools easier to learn. Instead of having lots of special purpose tools, you have uh, one general purpose tool. Dictionaries are like that. They're a general purpose tool. If you've learned that, you've solved a lot of problems in the Python uh, world. In fact, so the ladies who uh, teach Python, one of the things that you show early on is one of its most powerful tools, which is the dictionary. Like if you learn this one thing, it will take you very far. Uh, Pareto rule? 80% of Python is dictionaries. <laughs> the other 20% is stuff we make up. What is hypergeneralization? It is continuing with generalization, but when you've gone past the point of uh, diminishing returns, when all of a sudden the generalization makes you worse off, better than better off. It's over-engineering. Uh, the test is simply, does my transformation that I've made to code cause, uh, solve more complexity than it adds? If the tool adds more complexity, it's a net loss. And that's the real measure of telling you when to stop. So we need to decide whether the transform dict is a uh, hypergeneralization or not. By the way, how many of you have heard of uh, FizzBuzz? OK. If you haven't, uh, you ought to go out and try and program a FizzBuzz. It's actually a cute little uh, exercise, a two or three minute uh, exercise. And a lot of Python people can code FizzBuzz in two or three lines. Although the code looks a lot better if you just do it the straightforward way and use maybe eight lines, a very, very simple code. And it turns out, lots of people, just a minimal amount of programming training and put some actual thought into the problem can solve uh, FizzBuzz reasonably well. What's interesting about it is people who don't think about it very much, who are people who cut and paste from Stack Overflow, have a hard time with it. And so FizzBuzz is used as an interview question to, feel, uh, to weed out people whose sole programming experience is cutting and pasting from Stack Overflow. It has no other uh, uh, function. FizzBuzz, is it easy or hard? Easy. The problem with it, though, is it's hardwired into the numbers uh, 3 and 5. Do you think we should factor those out so we could pass them in as parameters? Well, probably uh, uh, we should. Now, the mathematics for it are, are we, are we going to stick with one integer size? You know what? We should probably do some dependency injection. If you want some fun, go click on this link, and I'm, I'm going to give you guys uh, not just the slides, but a PDF with uh, uh, live links. 
This is the advantage of using uh, Sphinx to make your uh, uh, slides. You want to go take a look at this. This FizzBuzz is about uh, uh, 600 lines of code, factored as a Java programmer would. They have dependency injection, strategy pattern, uh, all the constants factored out in a little separate library. And it shows what hypergeneralization is all about. Interestingly, it's a joke, but it's a joke in the same sense of a Dilbert cartoon. People laugh at Gilbert cartoons, and you realize, if everybody's laughing at it, we're all living in a little bit of a Dilbert world. We're laughing at it because it's true. People laugh at this enterprise edition because every hypergeneralization in it is, code, is stuff that we have seen in real code somewhere. All right, so here's an example closer uh, uh, to home. Do we have any atrocities in the standard library? Are in the core language itself? Yes, and why have they been left there? as a warning to future generations. <laughs> That's the only reason. Not because we don't like change or something like that. All right, so we have string starts with and strings uh, end with. So I have a series of our routes, and I'd like to uh, uh, filter the ones that end with HTML and X, uh, HTML. Here's the interesting part. Look at the double nesting of uh, parentheses. The outer parentheses are an operator that invokes the dunder method, dunder call. So it, it's a callable uh, a method. What do the inner parentheses do? It makes some data type that starts with T and rhymes a couple. <laughs> yeah, that's how I teach. I often give the uh, answers away. It helps people learn faster and have a, uh, a good time. By the way, I have to do a shameless plug. If you would like some corporate training from me, I would love to come out and uh, make all of your engineers awesome. I make a bold and unsupported claim that after uh, the intro and intermediate uh, classes, that uh, everyone who graduates the class is in the top 1% of Python programmers in the world. This is a bold and unsubstantiated uh, claim. That said, I put my graduates up against anybody. Uh, so call me up. I'd love to come back to uh, uh, Israel. All right, so this part, does it look a little weird to you? It should. Usually the only other time we uh, see it was when another, uh, in the case of a, another design defect, and that's with sockets, with a host port pair, which is passed in as a tuple instead of two separate arguments. This, so how do you think this came about? Was it because we were stupid? There was stupidity involved, no doubt. But <laughs> is the person who did this stupid? No. Are they a bad designer? No. They had a constraint. It turned out the other arguments were already taken, and so originally starts with an ends with only handled one argument. By the time it was realized that we wanted to uh, have multiple endings, the other arguments have been taken up. So surely they're there for a good reason, right? Starts with a hyper and ends with a generalization. A good reason? No, not at all. What was the root cause? The root cause was a hyper generalization of the string uh, signature for other string methods. Index legitimately has a start and end argument. We need that for common use cases for indexing, likewise with find. Counting, interestingly, also needs this because you can index to a starting point and then you want to count afterwards. These all have legitimate, well-known use cases around them. So I've deliberately not gone back into the code and annotated it to figure out uh, whose fault this was. This time I know it's not me. If you're on a project long enough, you don't want to an run annotate very long because every now and then you're like, what loser did, oh, that was me 10 years ago. All right, <clears throat> so. But in this case, I know this one wasn't me. I would never do something uh, uh, like this, a hyper generalization. So someone saw that, hey, three of these methods have a start and end, maybe the other one should have it too. And so we get these all the thing, time in, uh, on uh, the Python bug tracker. People hit us with what I call a lever argument. You did something in places A and B, so you have to do it in C, too. Turns out it's not very nice to use the foolish consistency as the hobgoblin of little minds quote, and we want to be very accommodating and accept somebody's first patch, and you know, it's, it's clean, it came with unit test, and they were mentored on some list. We have to take it, and after all, it's consistent. And it didn't break anything. And it looked prettier, and perhaps there's some advantage for uh, consistency. It's more memorable. You've learned it in one place or another. There was no downside to it at all at the time, other than it was absolutely unnecessary. This has never been used, as far as I know, in any code every, anywhere. And when you would use it, the code's not particularly readable. You'd actually be better off uh, slicing on a separate line and then doing a starts with for uh, readability. In other words, actually using this is a bad idea. 
you think I'm a big fan of this? But I didn't hate it. I didn't rail against it. I'm just, uh, you know, sometimes as a core developer, you just get used to things happening to the language that make you cringe a little bit. But uh, maybe people were cringing when I was putting things in too. And so we all make each other cringe. And that's how we live in the core dev world. So let that one go until we had to go expand this to uh, handle multiple arguments, at which point we had to uh, put it in as what data type that starts with a T and rhymes with a couple? Hypergeneralization, is it good for you or bad for you? Do you have a really good idea of what it is now? These words are all supposed to be part of uh, your vocabulary while you are uh, uh, doing design reviews. Who learned? Something new. Hmm. Who's sick? How many of you have any computing problems or ever had any computing problems at all? <laughs> you do? Those are a disease. We should cure it. And for, uh, to cure it, we're going to need drugs. You ready for drugs? Yeah. Remember, all of you have a disease, computer problems, and we need to fix it with drugs. Should I just approve every drug that gets posted on the uh, drug tracker? No? Is there a process? In fact, there is. Drug trials. Uh, so I'm saying that in a joking way, but I'm actually very uh, serious about this. Phase one uh, trial, safety and tolerability of uh, the pharmacokinetic effects and dose response. Phase two, dosing and efficacy. Phase three, efficacy compared to the gold standard treatment. And phase four, the one that we really don't want to do, which is the post-marketing uh, 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 surveillance. We put it in the standard library, and then we're going to see if it's any good. Transformed it. Okay, so phase four would be the wrong time to do it. It's kind of like a pilot trying to fix something in the airplane that they could have fixed on the ground, but they're in the air at the time, so it's hard to get outside. Okay, So we prefer the first three phases. So phase one is the studies with uh, uh, first studies with human beings. Uh, find the safest dose to identify side effects and most uh, effective way to deliver uh, the drug. How do we do number two? We do it when we write the documentation. We typically give an uh, example. We wouldn't be making it if we didn't think it was safe. What about side effects? Almost all drugs that are good for you uh, when you're sick are also bad for you in some other way. It's just trading off one effect for another. Otherwise, we just take them all the time, vitamins. So the transform dick, what are its side effects? Keep in mind, all drugs have side effects. So just because something has side effects doesn't mean uh, that it should be rejected. We should just identify them at this phase, which was done. And one of the side effects is we lost the access to the computed function. That we knew early on, because there's two dictionaries, there's some overhead to spade and speed. We didn't realize early on, it wasn't until I actually put this in front of users that we realized how complicated the stack traces were and that people had debugging problems. Some of my uh, class members love PDB and found it very difficult to trace through uh, dictionary lookups with PDB for it. And we found out that some dictionary invariants, some promises dictionaries make, are, uh, are broken. And of course, the dunder missing method is in for it. None of these things is catastrophic. They are all in the irritating category. May cause you to die prematurely, but otherwise you'll have the happy life like the person in the uh, pharmaceutical commercial. Okay, you get the gist. I promised the uh, lady I met yesterday a joke. That was it. Phase two is actually where most drugs fail in the, uh, in, in this, uh, in the trials. And that's seeing how well the treatment works against the disease. But it's not uh, uh, really where it falls down most of the time for proposals in Python. In fact, people are proposing a solution to a problem that they have. Those are the best solutions, our proposals. The worst proposals we get are somebody says, I've got a cool idea. Wouldn't it be neat if? And they don't actually have a use case. And these get, will get discussed for months on uh, the Python dev list or uh, uh, a Python ideas list without anybody saying, you know, there's no use case for this. Or they'll discuss things somewhat abstractly. It's a, a perpetual irritant for me. Uh, you, those of you who saw my super talk, you know that one of my irritants was super was put into the language, broadly discussed and broadly taught with uh, diagrams that has class A is the parent of uh, B and C, which is the simultaneous parent of D. There's a diamond diagram. Here's what super does. How many of you know what class A, B, C, and D do? Or why you would ever need the situation? So my super talk was all giving concrete examples of when diamond diagrams come up. And so you had some semantics behind it and uh, uh, some meaning. So when you try and design without meaning, you have nothing to protect you from uh, atrocities. So the transform dick 
actually fares fairly well for this. I had users generate a lot of use cases, and we tried a whole bunch of them out in the uh, classes. And it turned out it can be made to fit for uh, a lot of them. There are a handful of exceptions, and the uh, biggest exception is where you want some alternative dictionary type. So it's not easy to turn a transform dict into a counter, or a default dict, or uh, to have an underlying shelf, which is a persistent dict, or to chain them together. In other words, it doesn't fit together very well with the rest of the tool set and collections that are designed to snap together really well. But for the most part, it is past pays too. Not perfect uh, in things it can't do that we would want, but good. So where do most things fall down in uh, our Python proposals? It's phase three, the random group of larger patients, and that's, this is the important part. Is the new treatment better than the standard treatment? How does the transform uh, dict fare in this case? Not particularly well, because people would come up with all kinds of uh, uh, cute ideas for how to use a transform dict. We would go write some code with it. It would look OK. But then the second part was, now I presume you don't have a transform dict. What would you have done? We do it before and after. And then we compare which one is better. And guess what lost almost every time? Starts with the transform and ends with the dict. For example, by the way, none of, almost none of these examples were discussed in the PEP. Why not? That is an incorrect hypothesis. Some of them are actually quite interesting. In fact, the more I got into the transform dict, I found I was fascinated by it. I would dream about it a lot. It was an incredibly enticing uh, uh, concept. No, what was the reason it wasn't in the PEP? We mentioned it when we talked about Chris Alexander. It was designed uh, uh, in vitro, not in vivo. It was uh, designed for, I want to make a dic uh, uh, case insensitive conserving dictionary that's been generalized. It was designed without use cases around it. It was designed without talking to users. Fair enough. So does it surprise you that there were no use cases uh, that users would actually use it for? We hadn't talked to any of them. Don't design in isolation. Users are there for a reason. All right, the synonym example. We want to find a, a synonym for various keys. So you've got a, uh, a combat uh, role-playing game, and you have several things that are synonym for flee. Surrender is flee. Giving up is fleeing. Fighting is fighting. Attacking is fighting. Shooting is fighting. Talking is talking. Negotiating is talking. And bargaining is uh, a talking. You want those to be synonyms. So those are aliases uh, to each other. He said, keep, that's the alarm that says I should keep talking for another 20 minutes. All right. Oh, so you guys got the idea of the alias dictionary. That part's the given. That's what we're starting with. We are not at the transform dict yet. So the phase two trial, we've already identified the side effects. Is the transform dict fit for the task? Does it uh, have the uh, fitness for marchability uh, for this particular use? And the answer is yes, it can be used. Here's how you use it. You say alias dunder get item. Ladies on front row. What do you think about using a bound method to a dunder method and teaching that to beginners on the, in the first week? <laughs> we have two nays from the OLA. So one of the things this tells you is that this type of programming is out of the reach of a certain class of programmer that we want it to be in reach for. That said, Python has a full range of tools from fairly uh, advanced to fairly basic, and it's OK to have something on the continuum. We've just learned something about uh, where it is. There's other ways to do this. You can factor it out as a separate function. You can use uh, a lambda. Each of those things makes it slower uh, and wordier and makes it harder to assemble in your mind what is the whole set of transformations. But essentially, this transference dick says, I want to look up what happens when you flee. You lose all your weapons and points, but you live to fight another day. What happens when you fight? You die in a blaze of glory, but they sing songs in your honor. And what happens if you talk? You get captured and you're never seen again. These are the outcomes that we're looking up. The user doesn't know them in advance when they choose what they're going to do, which is what makes the game fun. It's like, I'll fight. Ah, songs are sung in your honor. You had a noble death. See you in Valhalla. Bye. All right. So we'd like to look up in here, and I think this code is actually fairly clear. It transforms the alias before looking these up. So you're faced uh, with three Nasigans who've wronged you, but you're in the right. They challenge you to defend your honor. What do you do? Flee, flight, talk, surrender, talk, negotiate, attack, shoot, bargain, and then we print the outcome of the action. How many of you think this line that I'm highlighting is very clean? I do. All right. 
So, uh, is it fit for the particular task? Did it work? Yes, it was actually uh, uh, quite usable, although it required non-first day Python uh, knowledge. But what about phase three trials? Is it better than existing solutions? What's different right here? What's different is we didn't use transform dict with alias get item, we just used dict. Which one is simpler, the first one or the second one? Second one. Second one by far. People learn this very, very early on. Typically, first day. Even if they're also learning Git and Django and all of that other stuff the first day. Dicks are important. All right, but down here, they have to do more work. Remember that beautiful line before that had one set of square brackets for action? Now we have to take the action, alias it, and do the outcome. How many of you think a beginner can handle that line? I know the answer to that is yes, because I teach beginners all the time, and they get something like that within the first uh, uh, hour of uh, uh, coding. We, uh, it's not enough to teach uh, the core uh, objects. You have to show how to compose them early on. That's how people actually learn to program. So the differences are that the, uh, it's a little bit more awkward to create the first one than the second one. Uh, the second one is a little bit more awkward to use than the first one, but only by a little. The original key feature of the transform dict was unused in this application. So our double storage and runtime performance cost and ugly stack traces are a cost without a benefit. The tracebacks are terrible to read, and the plain dictionary approach is much easier to follow through PDB. I didn't come up with that. I hardly ever use PDB, but one of my learners did. Do our, learners, uh, do our users teach us something? In fact, they do. Here's a second example that was uh, come up with somebody. Keep in mind, the people in my class are all uh, engineering professionals. They have, they have real jobs that they're doing all the time, using Python to solve real problems. They've been through two Python classes and have uh, had many months to program, and are bringing back, they're coming back to me the high level of sophistication. So all of these examples were pulled out of things that they actually did in real code. So there's a REST API to look up uh, uh, for a paid service that converts mail form postal addresses into canonical form. So there's some postal regulations uh, uh, for that sort of thing, which uh, I won't bring up here, but there is a very thick book on how you normalize an address. And it's hard to do and not easy to program yourself. So people uh, pay for it and their REST APIs to go out to a service, and they charge you by the number of uh, uh, cleanups, address cleanups that you do. So the lookups are slow, and they incur an actual charge. If you follow my link here, it'll show you how much it costs uh, uh, per address cleanup. So do we want to do a limited number of calls? And fortunately, earlier you made predictions on how many uh, calls. So we want to limit the calls. Now, assume we're a police department, which was the actual use case here, and they truly had a large in-memory dictionary with two million uh, street addresses, and the idea is you could type in somebody's address and find out who lived there, which is quite useful uh, uh, to the uh, uh, police. So here's the uh, uh, import for the scrubber function. The scrubber function activates the REST API, sends out. And is it going to be fast, the conversion? One, because it's fairly tedious. There's a lot of computations that have to be done. But also, we're sending it down the wire. And anything in the wire is a lot slower than over the CPU. And it costs us money. So here's our database. It's got normalized addresses back to people. Raymond Hedinger lives at this address. Cherry Pratchett and Luther Brissett, those two people don't exist. Well, Cherry used to exist, Luther doesn't. So now, the police have obtained a suspicious location, my house. These police can't spell. They've misspelled mansion. They spelled out court. Uh, uh, they just smushed Santa Clara uh, uh, together. They put a comma in here, and they spelled out caliph, which nobody does anymore. No one lives in caliph. All right, so is the transform dict fit for this task? It's actually quite easy. The transform function is scrub address, and we're passing in the existing uh, occupant dictionary, which gives us the transform dictionary, who is at this address. And then to look up uh, the suspect address, we just do square brackets, and we print out who the suspect is. Does our dict give us any more information? Yes, remember, it remembers the original key, so we can tell you the first reported alias. So, good news is it passed phase two trials. That code is read reasonably readable. That said, we have some patients who have much shorter life expectancy now, but haven't noticed it yet. Everybody lived. There, there are things wrong with this uh, uh, code, but it was easy to code. So that passes phase two. So phase three is the one that is a real killer for many pro proposals. Is it better than existing solutions? So we take the suspect address 
run it through scrub address, and that calls the REST API and gives you the cleaned up uh, address. Regular square brackets dictionary, look up, print out who the suspect is and the suspect address. Two OLAs. It is my hypothesis that within the first two hours of learning Python, a person can write and read this code. Is that a reasonable hypothesis based on your experience? They said yes. OK. How much training do you think they'd have to uh, have to write this, including the square bracket zero here, and the knowing that they have to make a second dictionary? Day, week, month? If they have good taste, never? <laughs> OK, uh, fair enough. This transform dict has some immediately evident issues. One is we needed to create a section dictionary name, which is irritating because the first one was correctly named, occupant. It already had the right name, so we had to invent the who is at this address. That's irritating, but not a killer. However, this is a problem. When we create the transform dict, keep in mind our uh, addresses up here that we started with are already normalized. They're already correct. Why would we store a non-normalized address? However, as soon as we turn it into a transform dict, it turns out scrub address is called for every entry. So just this one line cost you, what did I say, two million? Two million calls over your REST API that you're being charged for. Is that going to be slow and expensive? This line is literally expensive in terms of time and space. It doesn't look destructive and can pass code review. In fact, during code review, we've tested it with three addresses, and it worked fine and wasn't expensive. It doesn't scale. So that is an absolute uh, uh, disaster. Another irritating thing is this reported the first uh, reported alias address. That is the first mistyped address. Are we ever interested in the first mistyped address? No, so it reports uninteresting information but doubles the size of the dictionary and makes it awkward to use. Are we paying a cost for it every time we store or look up? In fact, we are. So that's uh, irritating. But there's something else really irritating, and the most killer feature here is number four. Remember, we said that once the transform function is called, there is no part of the public API that lets you get to the transform value. You spent milliseconds traversing the Atlantic, going out, cleaning up uh, postal addresses. They spent millies cleaning up that address, many millies sending it back. What is it uh, over to the US, about 120 millies, something uh, like that from here? 140? Uh, uh, each way times two plus a few millies on the other end. It cost you a half second per two million addresses, and now you don't get to look at it. You've paid for a cleaned up address. It's been put in this black hole of a container where data goes in and data doesn't come out. We like that with dev null, but not for this one that's been advertised as something that holds it. Is that a problem? OK. So summary. By the way, this uh, was not a talk about the uh, transform dict. Uh, I've included a source code for, uh, for you if you want to uh, play around. It is really all about design review. So here were the summaries. And so uh, I wrote down a lot of comments from my uh, reviewers. It's nice to have just uh, hundreds of uh, people uh, in many different classes, express different viewpoints after having, they have a homework assignment of, uh, at night to go home, play around with it, apply it to some use case, bring the use case in, have read the code, uh, told me what their debugging experiences were. And Patricia summed it up best out of all of the uh, 100 plus, uh, 200 plus reviewers. She said, there's a learning curve to be compliant to figure out what this thing does and how to use it and what to use it for. But when you work out the same examples with plain dicks, it only takes basic knowledge, and she left out, and it runs much more efficiently and doesn't eat memory like crazy. So this is a summary of the emergent issues. The biggest issue is that code without a transform dict is generally clearer, faster, more flexible, more intuitive, and debuggable. It is only slightly less succinct. And a user doesn't get a choice of which kind of underlying dictionary do you have. Usually, we like to be able to choose between a chain map, a counter, a default dict, and a shell. You're also not given a choice of which key uh, it, the original key is stored. Most use cases want the original not to be stored at all. This one has chosen the first key. Most ones that are actually deployed on case insensitive dictionaries choose the last key. And Nick Coughlin uh, said all of his use cases involve, I want to know the set of all the keys that were uh, looked up. All these things are hardwired uh, designed away to where you can't touch them. There's also only one accessor method to get to the original. So there's no dunder get, keys, item, et cetera, even though there's an underlying dictionary. 
I didn't. I mentioned before the uh, dictionary invariants were broken. Uh, not all of them, but a, a couple of uh, important ones. This one is: if a key is in a dictionary, should you be able to list the keys and expect it's in the list? You might think, but the untransformed is. Uh, uh, in, there's a transformation that's gone across. This one has the original key rather than the last key that you looked up. So simply. I put something in a container, then I check to see if it's in a container, it's now an invariant that will be false occasionally. Do you think that'll muck up your unit test? Fair enough. Uh, there's the spooky action at a distance, which is not always a, a, a bad thing, but the transformation is quite far removed from the square brackets they're looking up, so it is not necessarily obvious whenever you see D square brackets K that something else is being called along uh, uh, the way. So, in summary, uh, most of the use cases that were explored by the design reviewers, uh, the transform dict proved to be a distractor from better solutions. How many of you agree? All right, there's a formal uh, uh, rejection uh, uh, posted on uh, Python dev. I really, really, really wanted to say yes to this one. It would have been politically the nicest thing I could have uh, done. It would have been a nice peacemaking step to have done. Uh, I really wanted to say yes to it. We searched for really good use cases, and I was trying to find something that said, I need some basis for putting this thing uh, uh, in. And in the end, uh, just couldn't do it, because you know, 10 generations from now, they're like, that was your fault. Fair enough. Did you guys enjoy this talk? It's more than just a talk now, it's documentation. I'll give you a, a, a link to it, and I'll make sure that it's posted on the uh, website and everybody can download it as a PDF. Some of the links are worth following. The code, I believe, is worth uh, uh, reviewing. Thank you once again for inviting me to uh, Israel. It was a, a dream to come here. I'm so happy to be here. The quality of developers I've met are uh, uh, truly amazing. Thank you again.